So Hannah, at what age did you develop an interest in science? And along with that, what is the most, uh, what intrigues you so much about science? I've been interested in science for as long as I can remember. My mom's a physics teacher. My grandpa's, uh, he's a retired engineer, and my aunts and uncles all work in healthcare. So I've really always been surrounded by science. And I think the part of science that intrigues me the most is the way that it affects everything in life, um, even the most mundane parts of our life. There's still science there. And I've also always been fascinated by um, the fact that humans and all living things are built up from tiny atoms and that everything's from electrons to our DNA to our internal organs had to be arranged in the correct way for there to be life. And um, it's always seemed to me like statistically there's so much going on that something was bound to go wrong um, because of how many steps are required for life, but we're here. So I think that's super fascinating. Excellent. And I love your answer. It looks like you've uh, prepared that well, ironed out uh, why you enjoy science better than most physicians even are able to answer it. So well done, my friend. Well done. All right. Well, let's take this a little bit further. Why were you interested in pursuing research on vaping and its effect on my favorite organ, the lungs, uh, particularly COPD? Do you have a do you have any particular connection? Usually uh, someone at your age, or there's a personal narrative to that. So talk to me. Yeah, so right from the first day of high school, that was September of 2017, I walked into the bathroom at like 8 a.m. and saw some of my closest friends vaping. I was really shocked and also really concerned for them because when we were younger, we were always warned about the dangers of smoking tobacco cigarettes and using, using other drugs. But our teachers and doctors and all of the other adults in our lives hadn't really accounted for e-cigarettes. And all of my peers told me that they thought it was harmless, but I definitely had my doubts because um, there are very few things that you should be inhaling besides clean air. And I didn't think e-cigarettes were an exception to that rule. I also wanted to do some research on COPD because my aunt has an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and is at really high risk for COPD because of it. My cousins are right now too young to be tested for that deficiency, but they're also at very high risk for COPD. So I wanted to be able to learn as much as I can about COPD and also um, research e-cigarettes because of how many of my peers were using them. Understood. And knowing that peers in your school are using them, uh, you know, the hardest part um, uh, of your age group is sometimes these um, these factors that we know contribute to long-term poor health outcome. Um, you know, other generations faced it with combustible cigarettes, and now your generation is facing it with electronic cigarettes. Have, if you don't mind a personal question, have, have you been approached to use e-cigarettes? And if you have, how have you handled it? I definitely have encountered pressure to try e-cigarettes many, many times. Um, at first, I mostly was dealing with pressure by just being skeptical of it. Um, I'm typically skept skeptical of a lot of things um, when they first come out. And also I felt that e-cigarettes were echoing um, tobacco cigarettes in the way that in the beginning, everybody was using tobacco cigarettes and there were no, um, there were no known health risks at that time. So everybody assumed that they were safe. Um, however, I thought that the it was going to be a similar thing with e-cigarettes, but especially then, you know, e-cigarettes had only been on the market for a few years, so it was really too early to tell. So at the beginning, I was having kind of deja vu with all of the times that I had learned that cigarettes, when they first were available, um, people didn't see any health risk in them. And later, once I had really started conducting my research, I realized how gross e-cigarettes were, which was also a big base for me to stay away from them. Um, a lot of the flavors look pretty bad. And also, um, I found that e-cigarettes recondense back into a liquid inside the lung, which I just thought was really disgusting <laughs> and definitely steered me away from e-cigarettes. So tell me, what what did your research show? 
Um, so my research, I started it in October of 2017 and have spent most of the past three and a half years working on it. The first year of my project, I focused on investigating the components in e-cigarettes because very little was known about the chemicals in e-cigarettes at that time. There was very little legislation, so the companies didn't really have to publicize what was in the e-cigarettes. I used gas chromatography and was able to detect more than 50 different chemicals in e-cigarettes and identify nicotine, dastyl, methanol, ethanol, and propylene glycol. And one of the during the first year of my research, I focused on dastyl because it's the flavoring chemical used in microwave popcorn that can cause bronchiolitis obliterans or popcorn popcorn lung, which was in the news a lot like 20 years ago, I think, um, because it's an irreversible scarring of the bronchioles. So I focused on quantifying um, the amount of diacetyl, additionally using more gas chromatography, and found that in three uh, inhalations of an e-cigarette, there's about the user is exposed to about 18 parts per million of diacetyl, and the literature that I could find indicated that 100 parts per million of diacetyl was enough to cause respiratory damage. I also used infrared spectroscopy during my first year to find that there's no detectable amount of water in e-cigarettes because especially when they first came out, a lot of my peers had said to me that it was just water vapor in these e-cigarettes and therefore it was harmless, which um, again was something I was pretty skeptical of and through my research found that that's not in fact true. Um, something that I, that was, ended up being really instrumental to my research, but I discovered completely by accident, as I mentioned before, is that the e-cigarettes, the e-cigarette vapor recondenses back into a liquid almost as soon as it enters the body. I was using a gas syringe to draw some of the vapor out to put it through the GC, and I set it down for a few minutes, and then when I came back, all the gas was gone, and it had been replaced by little droplets of recondensed liquid, which was something that really surprised me. And I found that the recondensed liquid contains all the same components as the original pod liquid and the nebulized vapor, with the exception of the light hy hydrocarbons, um, such as methanol, ethanol, and acetyl, and those enter the body as gases. So after I found that the vapor recondenses into a liquid, I wanted to track where that liquid ended up. So I 3D printed a model human oral cavity, trachea, and bronchial tree, and then designed and built a two-chamber respiratory system out of plastic cereal boxes to mimic breathing. And after creating the lung model and respiratory system, I added fluorescent dye to the pod liquid so that when I shined a UV light on it, I could see where all of the liquid had recondensed in the lung, which is really, really cool. Um, it deposited throughout the oral cavity trachea and bronchial tree, and it was highly concentrated in the bronchial tree where there's human bronchial epithelial cells, um, or HPEs. And that discovery sparked the second stage of my research. Um, that was mostly my sophomore year of high school, so it began around September of 2018. And I looked at the effects of e-cigarette usage on HPE cells. I was able to get lab space at SUNY Downstate Health Sciences University in Brooklyn, and I began to look at the effects of vaping on HBEs. I ran a lactate dehydrogenase cytotoxicity assay to determine that the concentrations of e-cigarettes, diacetyl, and nicotine that I was using weren't going to kill the cells. So I found that the cells were viable through that assay, but also that e-cigarettes caused a 32% increase in LDH secretion and diacetyl caused a 26% increase. And those increases indicated to me that the cells were viable for further experimentation, but that e-cigarette usage and diacetyl can cause cell and tissue damage. After determining that the cells were viable, I looked at the expression of MUC5AC and MUC5B genes using a PCR. Um, increases in the MUC5AC and MUC5B genes have in literature been shown to be closely correlated with COPD development because those genes code for increased mucin production, which is one of the protein constituents of mucus, and increased mucus can cause COPD. 
So those were the genes and their corresponding proteins that I focused on. And I found um, increases in those genes similar to those, to those in literature of patients who had been smoking and eventually developed COPD. So the next step for me was using a Western immunoblot um, to, find, to track the proteins within uh, cells treated by e-cigarettes, and I saw a 54% increase in the MUC5AC protein that codes for the MUC5AC gene, um, which further supported my hypothesis that vaping can lead to increased risk for COPD. And then the final year of my project, which was this year, I bought and grew Drosophila melanogaster, which are um, wild type fruit flies. And I chose, I started my research by choosing 18 flies and separating them into six groups. Um, there were control groups and then flies exposed to both e-cigarette vapor and cigarette smoke. Um, and I separated the male flies, male flies from the female flies and had three in each group. So following the exposure period, I measured the locomotor activity, sleep cycle, sleep cycle, and lifespan of all of these flies. And I found that the fruit flies exposed to e-cigarette vapor had decreased lifespan and activity as well as disrupted sleep, sleep cycles, which was similar to the responses of flies exposed to cigarette smoke, which I found very interesting because um, those are definitely things I wasn't expecting, especially sleep cycle, I wasn't expecting that to be influenced by e-cigarette usage or cigarette usage for that matter. I also looked at body fat content by measuring triglyceride exp expression through absorption and found that the flies exposed to e-cigarette vapor as well as those exposed to cigarette smoke had lower body fat. And in the literature that I read, lower body fat has been seen in many COPD patients because it can be a sign of nutritional depletion. So my results from the HBE cells and fruit flies, um, to me, provide pretty compelling evidence for a possible link between vaping and COPD development. So in tying that into your personal narrative and wanting to be an advocate for people with predisposition to potential COPD, um, clearly making sure that uh, they don't become users or at least uh, in the vicinity of the usage of e-cigarettes is one way to make sure you can preserve their health. So being able to combat the epidemic of e-cigarette youth usage, tying it in with a personal narrative, and then using science to be your armor, I applaud you, Hannah. I applaud you greatly. Um, keep in mind uh, the way combustible cigarettes were even linked to COPD. Um, back in 1964 by U.S. Surgeon General Burnley's report, was um, not through the merits of lab laboratory science uh, that you have put forward. It was done through prospective observational trials done by Dr. Dorn in 1958. So I say this because that meant patient people became patients and passed away overnight and allowing us then to research on them and put two and two together. You're providing the science now that these high risk factors um, could be, um, uh, begins a strong case, strong case that these toxins you're putting into your lungs are going to develop into something dire. Um, COPD could be one of those outcomes. And COPD is kind of a grab bag uh, of an umbrella word. It just means something's causing obstruction in the airways. Um, but I, I see this, uh, not to take anything away, I see this because it's likely going to reveal a lot of new pathologies. Um, emphysema and chronic bronchitis were not well known in the 1950s and 60s. It's because of combustible cigarette use. use it, uh, combustible cigarette usage. So you're probably with this work, adding it to the literature to help protect an entire generation and protect an entire new set of lung pathologies to develop. On a side note, a couple of things you said earlier, water vapor is not harmless. I agree with you. Uh, just Google hot tub lung, where hot tub just putting out some nice heated water vapor, um, and it can have mycobacteria, uh, cousins of tuberculosis, and that can cause rather significant damage. And in, in the last thing I will also say is, um, just for the listeners out there, um, uh, popcorn lung did get a lot of media attention because of the diacetol, um, but it is one development of bronchiolitis obliterans. There's, there's a variety of other ones as well. Um, uh, just wanted to share that, uh, um, just so uh, someone doesn't think they're synonymous.